So today we're going to talk about spinal, uh, spinal tumor instability uh, and evaluating and stable and, and the, the evaluation to stabilize if needed. And uh, I'll speak for this for about 20 minutes. Here's some disclosures. I don't think they're relevant to this talk. And so when I think about is the spine tumor stable, I always think about it in three different ways for, for all the people listening. Uh, one, is it inherently unstable right now? And that's a question you have to ask yourself. You see a picture, you see a patient, is it inherently unstable this second? Because if that's, uh, that's sometimes easy enough, if you get, I mean, that's sometimes helpful because you can make a plan. However, we do not live in a static world. We live in a dynamic world. So what we're often asked is, well, the patient might be stable today, but are they going to be inherently unstable in the future? And so the next question is, will that stability worsen? And can we predict that? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And the final thing is, Will something that we do create instability? So sometimes people say, hey, this is stable. And they do a procedure where they take the tumor out and they don't stabilize, but in the very act of, of, of doing the surgery, we destabilize. And therefore that has a different type of, uh, of outcome. So you have to think about this, not only what are they today, are they gonna worsen? And is there something we're gonna do to them to worsen? That's at least how I think about it. So what I'll start off with is I'll start off with uh, giving a number of patients, think about it, and then we're gonna use some of the techniques that I bring up to try to evaluate it as we finish. So kind of like a workshop. So here's a 60 year old with cancer, minimal non-mechanical low back pain, progressive lower extremity pain and in, in, in a ridiculous pattern, otherwise intact, except for the pain, new lung mass as well, and the biopsy is a metastatic carcinoid. And so here you have an MRI and a CT sagittal showing uh, at, the, at the very least a, a D-gen spondy at four or five, but this lytic mass at S1. And the patient has this, like I said, minimal low back pain, it's ridiculous pain. And you sit there and say, is this lesion unstable? Um, and here's the CT and the, uh, both the axial and the coronal CT. All right, think about that. That was a quick uh, taste and we're gonna keep going. 35 year old now, history of breast cancer, upper thoracic pain, non-mechanical in nature, neurologically intact, and, only, and this is the only bony lesion that the lady has. And here is the lesion in the um, MRI sagittal, as you can see uh, the cervical thoracic junction. And then here you can see the CT showing maybe the pedicle uh, eaten away on one side with the body more on the right side and the coronal and sagittal showing that at least the anterior cortex is still intact of again, upper, upper thoracic. And here's an upper cervical case. It's a 30 year old female uh, with a history uh, uh, that she was moving the mattress around and it fell on her head. Uh, so maybe not the most uh, significant trauma, but a trauma nonetheless. And then prevented with severe neck pain, occipital neuralgia, no no metastatic disease, neurologic type with a CT guided biopsy of chordoma. And here you can see a lesion showing an upper cervical uh, lytic mass uh, in the CT, and then also an exophytic component soft tissue mass. Uh, a lumbar case. Now we're getting working uh, down. Uh, otherwise healthy daily yoga, just some mild abdominal pain, neurologically intact, and you see a lesion that looks like this on MR, and it looks like this on CT. Okay, so she's got a little deformity and she's got this, this kind of uh, what looks like a, a corduroy pattern or jailhouse pattern or polka dot pattern. I'm giving you a little hints on what this might be. Um, and this is what her standing films look like, her scoliosis films. And then finally, a gentleman, a 70 year old with progressive back pain and legs over months, uh, biopsies, non-diagnostic, no domestic disease, neurologically intact, but is in severe, severe mechanical pain, comes to the ED because of that. And here you see the MRI. And what I'm talking about is that S1 lesion, which you may say, oh, that's kind of subtle, uh, but again, patient in severe pain, okay? So let's go through this. Is the patient, are these patients inherently unstable, first and foremost? And so the idea of what is stable versus unstable is, um, is sometimes obvious and sometimes not. And of course, there's, you know, I go on the internet for statements and, you know, one out of four people are mentally unstable. Look at three of your friends. If they seem normal, it's you. So obviously everyone on this, meeting is normal. So maybe it is me. I'm the, I'm the guy with the instability talk. But the issue is that a lot of surgeons will say, listen, man, I know when I see it. And this is a famous line, Chief Justice Potter Stewart, in, when asked about uh, uh, the presence of pornography in media. And he says, you know, when you see it, you can just tell it is what it is. That's, that's good for the people who are wise and people experience. But for me, I always needed other people to tell me, you know, could, is this unstable? And as we learned through this, uh, a lot of us were frustrated by this. And so we went to things like Punjabi, who, uh, white and Punjabi, who had just described clinical instability, really in the setting classically of fractures or degen, the ability for the patient under normal physiologic loads to have really no neurologic deficit, no major deformity, no incapacitating pain. 
So although I, you know, God forbid, I may have a lesion in my spine right now, I might have a tumor or a fracture or a degen issue. If I'm not under normal physiological conditions, having a severe neurological deficit, pain or deformity, I'm probably spinally stable, all right? And so a number of things that have, have come over the years, like the AO classification of instability, uh, uh, and, and Jens Chapman has been involved with AO for years and has been involved as a trauma, leading trauma surgeon. These are things that are really great for trauma, sitting there saying, is it a compression or distraction rotational injury? And you can have diagrams like this, where you can either start at the bottom and say, is it, is it no injury and work up or start in the top and say, let's just rule out a really bad injury and then work down to a very minor injury. And this is a little bit of flow chart. The issue is that when it comes to tumors, it's not the same mechanism, right? Because you're not having normal, normal uh, bone or, or normal ligaments and then getting a major trauma and uh, break something um, because the mechanism energy are not similar. Also, uh, tumors usually involve the bone and then and leave these ligaments intact. And then finally, the issue is that if you uh, break the spine, a traumatic issue, you probably, you, in some cases, you can heal with a brace or heal on your own. While in tumors, if you fracture and the tumor keeps growing or you radiate it, uh, there's a chance that it won't get better. So for this reason, spinal instability is a little bit different than what we think of when we think of tra traumatic instability. And so when we look at this, we have to think at least about some aspects of the spine and think that, you know, the vertebral body, uh, it just depends of course on where you are, but at least in the lumbar spine, up to 80% can be loaded in the front. And we know that in thoracic spine, we have a kyphotic posture and a lot of that force can be loaded in, in, in thoracic spine, although maybe not 80% because we have ribs as well. Uh, the vertebral body ends up being a classic sign, a classic place where fractures can occur. And here, uh, uh, Dr. Krishnani at a Cleveland clinic wrote a paper thinking about modeling. And he made this kind of, you know, diagram after a child's toe, I think, uh, uh, from the 80s that I had, I never could figure out. But this was the idea that you could actually plan and say, you know, let's look at this. And if maybe a certain level of certain number of these cubes are gone, we can at least model uh, and we can use this as we see patients. Um, what I liked one of the most is an older paper from the, from the 90s with John Dymar and others on it, um, where they really looked at this biomechanical study and what they found, and I say this all the time, I said this earlier this week, is that the likelihood of, of fracture is not only dependent on the amount of cross-sectional bone gone. So not only the volume that the tumor takes away, but the quality of the, of the bone left, right? So if you sit there and say, hey, if it's 50% gone, that's really bad. If it's 30% gone, it's really bad. Well, it also depends on what you have left. And if it's osteoporotic, well, then that's a very unstable uh, potential thing. And also, if you're going to radiate this with high-dose radiation, that bone might, might likely have osteonecrosis down the road. So you're going to have bone that is under significant uh, risk of fracture. So things to think about. And then finally, last thing I'll say is about the muscles and osteoligamentous complex. This has been worked out uh, more and more uh, in deformity literature. When we think about the muscular envelope, when we think about po uh, proximal junctional kyphosis, and it becomes a factor when we think about the tension band when we put in constructs. But this is obviously a priori, if the tension band has been destroyed by a tumor, the muscles of the ligamentous complex, uh, the ability to hold this uh, suspension bridge is gonna be an issue. And so when we think about force application, we also have to think back to our lever arms and our internal axis of rotation, the IAR. So if you have something that is loading completely vertically, uh, there may be a burst fracture pattern. While if there is a moment arm to it, in other words, the force is a little anterior to the internal axis rotation. So on the left, you have the forces applied directly to the vertebra and the, on the, on the uh, right, you have the forces applied anterior to it. Uh, you're gonna have a compression say versus a burst fracture. And so in those pa in patients who have say a slight lower doses pattern, uh, when, the, when the force is applied from the head down or the, or the body down or gravity just from the top down, these are usually going to lead to bursts. So if you have the lower cervical or the, or the mid lumbar. However, if you have something where there's some kyphosis, uh, uh, you're going to lead to more kyphosis. Kyphosis begets kyphosis as gravity continues to push that. And this tumor is located in the exact area that we think of when we do, say, a deformity operation and we stop the construct at the, at the thoracal lumbar junction and we get PJK. So this is a similar type uh, natural action of, of the forces on the patient in an area of slight kyphosis. What I would say is most concerning is in the areas of say the cervical spine or, or other areas of the spine when the posterior elements are destroyed. And we know from certain trauma literature like the T-Lix, the thoracal lumbar trauma scale, that when those posterior elements are destroyed in a trauma, the spine is very unstable. The same is true in a deformity. I mean, same is true in a tumor. So if you have uh, say in this patient with a fracture or tumor in the front, but some in the back, 
these are very, very unstable. And so, you know, I, I sometimes hear patients uh, say, you know, I had cervical stenosis and I was, the doctor said, you know, don't laugh, don't breathe. You got to have this surgery away. And the patient obviously walked in to the clinic and then they send them home and maybe they get their surgery done a month later. These are patients where if you do see, you probably are never letting it. These are the ones that you really say, if you were to uh, uh, be um, moved too much, you could really uh, cause significant damage because the cervical spine is very flexible to begin with. And then you take out the posterior elements and it can be very significant. So be mindful of when you see patients like this, they can be quite unstable. And the classification systems, I don't want to make you memorize a whole list of them, but just to give you a sense of where we've been and where we've come, the classification systems start out like most of them do uh, by telling you what things look like. This one's purple, this one's blue, this one's polka dot. And so the first ones were really saying this had a type one, a type two. The issue with classification systems, as we all know, the ones we like are the ones that can be prognostic or prescriptive. You can say, if you have a grade three, you should have this. Or if you have a grade three, this means this will happen, either predictive or, pro or, or prescriptive. And this was really just descriptive. So it wasn't really as uh, uh, fully uh, accepted, although it was a great first start. And then there's other ones like the Azdorian paper in the 1990s looking at all these different types of saying, well, if it looks like this in the cartoon, it might be actual instability or it might be impending instability. And so I think that, you know, you try to look at these pictures and say, okay, is my patient like a 1B or they look like a 2B or, and it was also not as uh, intuitive because you kind of had a match, you know, does my patient look like one of these as opposed to maybe breaking it down into elements. And so a number of, of uh, spinal oncologists surgeons, orthopedic and neurosurgeon, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists got together and really just started as a Delphi approach and really try to say, what can uh, these experts think about? And they took the white and Punjabi uh, description and just added metastatic or neoplastic disease. So it was the same thing that if you had pain under normal physiological issue, uh, uh, situation, you had pain, deformity, or neurology, neuro, abnormal neuro, neurologic uh, uh, symptoms, you were considered unstable, of course, in the setting of a neoplastic process. So same as the white and Punjabi. And through a number of discussions based on the literature and a number of rounds, uh, an, about uh, seven air, six areas were identified that were somewhat you know, thought, thought to be helpful in the setting of something was uh, unstable. So one is location. Obviously, what we always think about things in thoracic spine as leading a little more stable or in the sacrum. So obviously the junctional areas were the areas that a lot of people thought you would get more points for if a tumor was there and therefore more instability. Um, and you can see the junctional areas of the occipital cervical, cervical thoracic, thoracal lumbar and lumbosacral. And then you got down to the ridge where they had no pain, which really I think is, is as for a lot of us have be, has become really probably the biggest predictor in the number of papers that have come out since saying this is probably should be more weighted. There should be more points to this. If someone has mechanical pain, mechanical axial pain or mechanical radicular pain, uh, they should have, they, they are basically telling the world by decompensating that way that they are unstable clinically. Um, bone lesion, Obviously, lytic is worse than blastic, even though blastic people think it's harder. In some cases, blastic actually is also weaker than normal bone because there are pockets of lytic in that. Alignment, if the patient is starting to, to lean one way uh, or shift, obviously that would be something that we would think about in terms of stability. And then maybe the amount of collapse, which, which some people agree and some people don't. Some people think when something, something collapses, maybe it comes into a new stability. So as we've thought about this afterwards, maybe not as much, but again, the posterolateral involvement probably even more. So maybe the pain, at least in my opinion, the pain and the post involvement are probably more concerning than any other symptoms here. And maybe the location. While the alignment, virtual body collapse, et cetera, uh, you know, maybe not so much, uh, but a lot of papers have come out discussing this. And then you get this handy dandy um, uh, tally where if it's low, it's stable, if it's high, it's unstable. And then of course, the kicker is that where most people live in the world is in the middle. As we know, most things in life are in the gray. There's a potential unstable, and that leads you to think about um, people be a little more uh, 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 conservative maybe in those areas. So this was looked through and the, the sensitivity and specificity were reasonable, the validity and the reliability was good through, the, through, the, um, through the, all the, the writers of the papers. And then since then, and there are papers I just looked up today, there's about 200 papers that if you just look spinal instability neoplastic a score, uh, you know, 200 papers in, in PubMed. And like I said, some of them have come up with ideas uh, saying that maybe it's not three categories, maybe it's two. And if you're 10 and above, you're unstable and you're nine and below, you're unstable, something like that to try to make it easier on people so that you have less of a, less of a uh, ambiguity in the middle. Um, now let's go through this. Um, here's the sacral case. 
And I'm going to show you cases that have some dy dynamism to them. In other words, you don't sit there and say, clearly, you know, when you see it, but there's a patient with this tumor and it's lytic at the sacrum, right? We talked about this one. And if you use this scoring system um, and you add up your points, you end up having, um, let me just move this a little so I can read them. You end up having about a seven, which is potentially unstable. And you might sit there and say, hey, let's manage this in some way other than surgery or stabilization. Um, excuse me one second. Uh, but this patient, while coming from another center for a second opinion with me, actually in the drive to see me, uh, experienced new mechanical radiculopathy and then repeat images showed this fracture or this lytic lesion had really collapsed. And you can see now in the coronal, maybe there's fractures through the end plate of the ala as well, the top, so, or th through the end plate of S1, I should say. And so now you sit there and say, hmm, that lady was potentially unstable and then it very quickly had become more and it becomes much more obvious. So the point of this is to just give a, a case to show where something is potentially unstable or stable, but also show that again, these patients, depending on what they're doing and their evolution may change. And you have to have some sense that a tool is just a tool. And of course, a, tool, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And so don't rely too heavily on this. Use it as a tool in thinking that these patients are living dynamically. So this patient underwent a stabilization posteriorly. The next question is, will stability worsen? Can we predict that? And here's this upper thoracic patient I showed you before with this lytic lesion in, uh, from breast cancer, only sight. And this patient was seen by a colleague of mine who uh, is a neurosurgeon who does radiation, on, does radiation uh, uh, treatments through focused radiation. And uh, said, you know, I think this is going to be fine with radiation. Talked to radiation oncologist and radiated, and and there's probably some support to that, right? Maybe some potential instability. Uh, the person's a, a brain surgeon who doesn't do as much spine, and said, hey, this looks pretty solid. Uh, uh, and and if and if we looked at this thing, it's potentially unstable. But if you're thinking about giving this patient radiation, what's not here in the SIN score is what we're doing to this patient. So now, if we give radiation. Are we going to weaken the remaining bone? Remember, I talked about cross-sectional bone loss, but also the bone remaining. So this patient had radiation about a month and a half later, had, had this uh, lesion. And now if we kind of add this up, this is, a, this is unstable. So again, think about how to evaluate them, but also think about if you're going to do something. So this lady had a surgery uh, like, uh, like this to, to treat her uh, alignment and, and, her, and her pain. But also to think about maybe, does that mean, you know, is Dan trying to say, that everyone should have surgery. Is that his point? Uh, if, this, if they're potentially stable? No, maybe that lady before she had her radiation or simultaneous or around the same time, maybe she could have had a cement augmentation of that level because maybe she was a little higher risk um, of that happening. And that would have maybe avoided uh, uh, the surgery. So if you look at this, a number of papers have come out and here's a paper. And if you just go down to the middle of patients treated with radiation, uh, you know, up to almost 15% of patients can have a new uh, tumor. And there's a number of papers that have looked at this, this is a nice series because it's got about 3,000 patients. And the patients who are at risk for developing a fracture after spinal steroid radiation were those who already had lytic disease. That's, that's, that's straightforward. Uh, maybe a baseline fracture to begin with, so maybe the fracture got worse. A higher dose, right? So more energy delivered, and maybe that has something to do with it. Uh, deformity, maybe they have the, uh, some vectors that have increased their propensity if they have a deformity already. Older age, which is probably a precursor or a uh, substitute for weak bone. Uh, and then maybe greater amount of the bone involved. And so when you sit here and say, these are patients at high risk, then you can sit there and say, okay, the sin suggested this, but if I have patients with high risk factors for fracture after radiation, maybe I do something um, sooner. And you can sit there and say, well, Dan, if they fracture, you know, no, be it, that, that maybe that lady wouldn't have had to be treated like you did, but in this study, you know, a third of the patients underwent uh, intervention. So, so they think about that. And then finally, will our surgery create instability, right? So here's a patient who has a chordoma and a fracture. And maybe this is something that is not overtly unstable. If you look at C2, it's kind of got little, you know, little moth eaten ball, moth ball, uh, moth eaten holes in it. And uh, you look at it and you say, well, let's add it up with SINs. And, and this is potentially unstable, but maybe this patient can, can heal and uh, won't have to have uh, any procedures done. But then if you sit there and think about treating this patient surgically, you are gonna drastically destabilize them. So if you look at a tumor like this, you can go through a number of different avenues. Uh, in this case, we did uh, the posterior first. And then instead of doing a jaw split because this was high or a submandibular, this was done through the nose and through the mouth. And the osteotomies were done in the clivus and the condyles and then releasing the arch. And then we went through the neck uh, to uh, take the tumor out. And there you can see the fecal sac and taking the tumor out. And this one, I did not reconstruct. I since have changed this and now I use um, 
fibular struts in the front that are vascularized, but this is one I did off from the back because I didn't feel comfortable placing the strut from the front because I went through her nose and her and her neck instead of going through her jaw. If I go through the jaw, we can place the big uh, uh, a fibula like that, but in this case, I could not place it, so we did in the back. And this lady fused, but you can obviously see this is an extremely unstable spine, right? She's basically got nothing connecting her head to her spine. So although she was a SINS that was potentially unstable, the surgical procedure made her unstable. So if you went in there and took something out, I think I'm making the point, obviously the SINS changes when you change the bony anatomy, uh, so you have to be thoughtful. Similarly, in this lady with, with daily yoga with some indolent abdominal pain, uh, she had this tumor and uh, we biopsied it and it was found to be a hemangioma. All right, it was um, sometimes people who take these, uh, I don't know if it was said before, but they stick a needle in this and out comes uh, lots of bright red blood and then a little bit of, on, the, on this path specimen of blood cells and endothelial cells and they say, it's non-diagnostic. No, that is diagnostic. That is a hemangioma, uh, that very, very exercise. So. You sit there and this lady ended up, we ended up watching um, because we asked to embolize it. And they said, no, the vessels went to the interspinal, uh, the vessels. And we've, we've written on this, that a lot of hemangiomas can often have a damp quiz associated with them. So we said, watch it. Then she got, then she got neurogenic claudication from the uh, stenosis. So we had to operate on her, um, and offer something like a lam lumbar laminectomy. But given this, we had to think about, are we dealing with someone who's unstable? And if I get into that bleeding tumor, or if I try to take it out, am I going to be, uh, um, you know, down a rabbit hole. So you sit there and say, huh, does this lady have instability? And, and she's stable, right? She's really actually stable. She does have some deformity. She has what I would call uh, adult deformity, adult, uh, uh, you know, acquired deformity, but I don't think it's a de novo deformity from the tumor. I think this is just the, her normal alignment. So I still give her a five and say it's stable, but if we decide to treat her and we couldn't do it via a trans uh, arterial embo, you can do a direct embolization, do something like this and then remove the tumor. And now she's getting a forward construct uh, with a cage because uh, obviously we 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 did a, a total uh, vertebrectomy, and then finally the last case is a sacral case, and I throw this in here because you sit here and I think you say, hey, this is where's the lesion? Oh yeah, at the bottom, S1. Yeah, okay, okay, it doesn't look too bad, Dan, older patient, but this patient's in incapacitating pain, and so when you kind of go through this the system, you say, well, it is junctional, mechanical pain, lytic, de novo deformity, a little bit of compression. This person's got an unstable fracture. Uh, and so sometimes doing this exercise of this, of this technique, you really do see how things play out. And this is unstable, but that doesn't mean that this patient needs a crazy operation uh, necessarily at the other one. They are unstable, but this patient underwent a sacroplasty and did very well from this. This pain got better significantly. So again, uh, many ways to think about this, the, the level, the site, the instability, the inherent stability going forward, and also the options that we have. And, and we know in a randomized controlled trial, one of the best studies we have is level one evidence that vertioplasty can really help in patients with fractures from cancer. And so this is one of the best studies out in spine and it shows that cement can really help these patients. All right, so at, in the end, I'll conclude now that really reviewing these biomechanics is a little bit different than a trauma, but some things that we can take. And when we look through these, we think about classifications as most likely the SINs, which is the most used now, but integrate this into your tool system if it helps, but also understand that it is a static, a static evaluation. And as you move on, uh, with that patient, think about what you're doing to impact them. Hey, Dan, I'm not allowed. I'm on a serious word account, uh, so I can't ask many questions. Uh, so first of all, I appreciate the talk a lot, as we all do. And I thought that was a, a very cool demonstration using cases and the many de deliberations. About the SIN score, I think you, uh, you have uh, identified me as one of those uh, kind of a side swipers who always complains about the uh, undecisive group being too large. Uh, so so uh, I think when we do these things, it's a real problem and our indeterminate group, for whatever reasons, is just too big because it's the default motion for most people. Uh, but it's meant to be a checklist. Now, my main question goes to the following. How come that our oncologists still don't understand the SIN score? I've never heard of it, uh, at least in the Northwest Coast. I don't know how it is in San Francisco. Uh, it's literally just like blank stares. It's just not there. Yeah, it's funny you say that. Maybe it's a regional thing because you know what? It's like anything when you uh, when you ask for something and you get it and you're like, oh, so sometimes I would talk to our oncologist and I'd say, I think we can watch this patient. I think we can watch this patient. And they'd say, sin score of potentially unstable, Dr. Shuba. And I'd say, oh, thwarted. You know, so I it's funny because I've actually had the racial oncologist um, often use it and say, look, potentially unstable. It's, you know, at the very bottom end, potentially unstable. And we're just worried and we're worried. And I feel like I'm a little bit more 
pushed into doing something aggressive. So I think it is maybe a regional thing. Um, one thing I think, you know, you can do is if you spread it amongst your oncologist and radiation oncologist, because usually it's, for me, it's the radiation oncologist because they're the, they're technicians like us. They actually look at the images and they, and they think about them while the medical oncologist, you know, usually reading the report and saying, you know, send them to RADS or surgery. So, you know, pass it on to those rad on people. And I think it will permeate, but do beware that uh, anything that you share can and will be used against you. Uh, if they say this is a uh, potentially unstable and uh, it's back in your court and you go, Oh, I thought that we could watch this. So it is a good, uh, it is good to always to have those colleagues that challenge you. And I'm being a facetious, of course, um, but uh, something to think about letting your rad on people know they, they do know more than about this than the med on people in my experience. So we're on a strict time diet now, Dan, so much wealth of information, uh, wisdom, maybe you can hang on. Um, I think Dr. Abdul-Jabbar sure. is going to guide us to the next uh, live demonstration.